I'm Sasha Chua talking to Abdi Grimm. So thank you, Abdi, for making time to chat with me about Emacs. I'm really curious about how you're using it, how you got started with it, what are the interesting things you've come across, and, and also what you'd like to be able to do with it as well, just in case other people have come across things that will make that happen. So tell me, how did you get wrapped up into doing this in the first place? Emacs. How did I get started with Emacs? I um, So as a programmer, I'm a programmer. Um, as a programmer, I cut my teeth in like the defense contracting world. And that's like a lot of sort of old, big, old school places. It's, it's, it was one of those places where you didn't, you didn't learn and you didn't use an editor. You didn't like pick an editor. The project would pick an editor. <laughs> yeah. So, so Emacs was chosen for you. Well, no, no, that's the thing. No. Nobody ever chose, but, but so, you know, I wish, no, um, this, so it was, it was this, this world where like you would get onto a project and it's like, okay, on this project, we use visual C++ version six, you know, and then you go into another project and it's like on this project, we use code, right? Code, right? Was a big one at the place where I, I was, I don't think anybody's heard of that at this point, but, but, um, you know, and, and it was, it was this kind of an environment that's bizarre to me now where you would actually switch your programming environment just because the project or because of, you know the because of the technology the project was using. Yeah. So, you know, if you had, you know, muscle memory for another editor or something or maybe <laughs> you you'd written screwed. some macros. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, exactly. You were screwed and and you know, that seems nuts to me now, but it was completely normal to everyone then. And you know, and so it really discouraged you from customizing your environment because, you know, one, six months later, you'd move to another project and, and it'd all be out the window. And I was, a you know, sort of a, I guess, um, snotty enough little upstart that I, you know, thought that that was kind of nuts. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I, I was like a really young program. I, I got started in that world when I was still, um, you know, my late teens. I was like 18. And, and um, so I didn't, I really was not like, in, I had not been inculcated into the Unix world at all or anything like that. But I kept looking around for better tools. And I, I you know, came across obscure Windows text editors that had macro capabilities. And I would use those to speed up my work. And... You know, and they were horrible, like horrible, horrible <laughs> macro capabilities that I would not, you know, would make me, you know, my eyes bleed to look at now, I'm sure. But it kind of set me on the path, you know. And at the same time, I was learning scripting languages. I was, you know, I was learning Perl, and then I was r learning Ruby and Python and, and Tickle and stuff like that. And, and it kind of set me on the path towards, like, uh, the idea of building up a programming environment that, mm -hmm. was, that was customized to my own needs. And um, at some point in there... I, you know, I got really sick of the whole changing editors when I changed project project thing. I, I saw some of the cool stuff that you could do with Emacs. You know, I saw articles. I used to spend hours and hours browsing um, WikiWiki. You know, Word yeah, Cunningham's yeah, yeah, original yeah. Wiki, and yeah. and so from places like that and, and and around the web and Slashdot and whatnot. You know, I would see the stuff people were doing with Emacs. I saw InfoDoc. That was an old an old um, sort of set of add-ons built or a distribution of Emacs that had some interesting programming navigation capabilities that I haven't seen anywhere else. And, and so, and I just saw stuff that people were doing. I saw like GNUs, you know, the, the yes. mail, yes. mail reader, which is mail and news reader, although I was always more interested in, in it as a mail reader, but that was like, is, was, and still is the most powerful mail and news reader in existence. It's just that <laughs> the funny thing is it was one of those apps. So like, when I first, you know, was interested in Emacs, it really was more about the apps that people had built on it than it was about the editor itself. I mean, I was interested in using a, re a true programmer's editor, but it was really what really pulled me in were the apps that people had written on it. And, you know, and, and what's, what's kind of embarrassing is that to this day, I have made stabs at trying to embrace GNUs. Like, that was one of the first things that brought me oh into Emacs. Gosh. And I still, like, to this day, every few years, I'll be like, I'm going to start using GNUs. And I, it still hasn't <laughs> stuck. And it's like, you know, 10 years later, it still hasn't stuck because, man, that thing is complicated. And, like, as soon as you think you've got it all set up, it comes up with some obscure I error and you're like, uh, screw oh. it. I'm going back to Gmail. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but 
I've got but, some uh, uh, DoveCloud offline IMAP uh, Gmail configuration somewhere that you might find useful for GNU's. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, yes. So, yes. So, GNU's. Um, yeah. You know, or, I, like, I'd find out that it was just really slow talking to Gmail or something like that. And, and so... So I still ha haven't gotten up and running on that, but, but, but the funny thing is I still am using Emacs as much for the apps that people have built on it as for the editor itself. So like um, one of the reasons that I love it so much today is org mode. As, yes. you know, I'm, I know you're familiar with org mode. Um, way back in, you know, back in those days that I was using Emacs on Windows, I used Emacs Wiki a lot. Yes, I, used that I as remember that. Personal org I, I would collect notes in it um, and, and, you know, Emacs Wiki, I think. Well, even John, what, John is it? John Weigley? Yes. Or what? Yes. Okay. Uh, Weigley, I think. Um, anyway, so yes, yeah. Emacs Wiki. So he, I mean, he came up with with Emacs Wiki, right? Yes. That was his, and but even he, even isn't like even he doing stuff with org mode more now? Yes, yes. We, uh, we, like most of us has, have jumped ship. I I used to maintain yeah. planner mode, which was built on top of Emacs Wiki that John right. had also written. Um, but right. because there's which been so much activity. You yeah. maintain planner mode, and I used planner mode. Oh, that's so I wonderful. <laughs> but Org um, is fantastic. Yeah, and, so and, and Org kind of though. came on the scene and it just ate everything else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it really, you know, and, and it, a lot of it's just kind of the, the, the model of organization, I think. You know, I, I, I used to, like I said, I used to use Emacs Wiki. I used to use planner mode, and... You know the fundamental problem that I, I love wikis, but the fundamental problem that I found with it was just the I. It was just like not being able to find things. It was like yeah. you know every, there are all these little nodes scattered around, and it's like my filing cabinet. Like if I can't like I can find something if I can remember what I filed it under, but if I can't remember what heading I filed it under, then I'm screwed. And then I kind of had the same issue with with any kind of of personal in, organization. Yeah. And the thing about org mode is that. If all out because you usually keep everything in a big file that's just really well hyperlinked and really easy to search and to collate and all that stuff, but it's basically still a big file. So if all else fails, you can always just do an incremental <laughs> search from the beginning until you find. It. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. That, that really changed it. Yeah, yeah. I like the slicing and dicing of things in different agenda views too. But yeah, that's one file uh, really worked out. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I um, right. So I used, like I said, I used uh, Emacs Wiki in planner mode, and that was one of those apps that people had built on Emacs, and and now I use org mode a lot. So I use org mode. I actually don't use org mode um, for organization right now. Um, I've made some stabs at that. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really bad at sticking to organization methods. That's okay. Uh, you know, it's another of those things that, like, every few years, I'm like, I'm gonna get organized. <laughs> I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to do GTD or I'm going to do, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, whatever it is, you know, yeah. and very little of it ever sticks. Um, but I do use org mode to write. Yes. Um, you know, it's funny. It wasn't, it was really, I guess, originally intended more as like a personal organizer kind of thing, but, but I use it for authoring. Um, mm -hmm. and it is so fantastic for authoring. And I just I have not found anything better uh, for that. I mean, I so I've written a couple of ebooks at this point, and um, org mode was a big part of making that possible. And and you know, part of it is just the fact that um, it has such good support for embedded code. Yes. I mean, there are lots of tools that you can you know that give you some support for. You know, a, a chunk of this this chunk of text is code, and maybe it'll even give you some syntax highlighting or something. But the fact that that in org mode, you know, I can press Control C um, uh, quote, and it'll drop me into a Ruby buffer, which is based on that chunk of code in the original org mode document. And I can, you know, I have all of my regular Ruby mode stuff in there, and I can even execute the code yeah. and see the result in the org mode buffer. And so. You know that kept that meant that that in writing like exceptional Ruby, most of the code samples in there are executable, and either either the book actually has you know either the book has the the output of the sample right there in the book, um, and that's generated directly from the code by org mode. Yeah. It's not like I pasted it in, or maybe I had maybe it was a code sample that di I didn't need the output, but I would still have it generate the output, just not export it. Yeah. Um, but I 
Oh, but but every code sample in there, I was able to test in line. I didn't have to <laughs> wow. like, you know, get it working in another file and then make sure it was working and then paste it in and then realize that I actually wanted to change something about it, and so I would have to change it in the original file and then make sure that worked and then paste that in. None of that. It was just drop you know it was just drop into the the code buffer change it around a little bit drop out execute it make sure it still, still runs and it, it's it it speeds up the process of of authoring just unbelievably and then you know throw on throw on top of that the fact that it can export to, to LaTeX and it can export to HTML and and it can export to text and you know it's just insanely productive I know, I know. So yeah, so org is a huge part of your authoring workflow. Are there other interesting things that you do with Emacs that totally blow you away? <laughs> um, so okay, so I have this. Uh, my job now is this screen screencast yes. series that I top us. Um, I of course use use Emacs in all of those videos, and some fun things that I've done with that. Well, the 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 question that I get more often than anything else in relation to that um, is, how do you make Vim insert the result of the code right in the buffer? <laughs> Which the answer is parts, first of all. It's you <laughs> <laughs> uh, and second. Uh, I actually didn't do very. I actually had, didn't have to do much Emacs hacking at all to do that because there's a, a Ruby package called uh, R Code Tools, which comes with a, a filter program huh. called a, a XMP filter, huh. which basically you put uh, Ruby code in one end and you put specially formatted comments in where you have like the comment symbol and then a hash rocket, and it sees that and it takes the code that was on the left side of that specially formatted comment evaluates it and puts the result on the right side. What's that? And What's that package again? Uh, the package is called R Code Tools. That's R -code the gem. R Tools. Okay. So that's a gem. And, gotcha. And then the the uh, the program it actually it's actually a set of tools as the name suggests and the program inside it is XMP filter. XMP um, filter. Wow. And um, and that's a really old package. It's not not anything new. It's, it's ex various forms of XMP have been around since like the early days of Ruby. Um, there's there's even sort of a, a form of it built into IRB, and um, so and and as it happens, XMP filter or R code tools comes with Emacs integration. So there's actually an Emacs mode for it. <laughs> uh, so all you have to do is pull that pull the EL file out of the gem or reference it in the gem, and and you're pretty much set to go. All I actually had to do was bind it to to a, um, a you know, key binding in Emacs, and um, I bound it to Control C, Control C, which is the you know kind of standard execute this thing. Do stuff. Sort of stuff. Like, That's yeah, the yeah. magic button <laughs> in, my, in Emacs, and uh, nothing else. I to my surprise, nothing else in Ruby mode was already bound to that, and so I I <laughs> bound. It. I mean, we also have in for Ruby, you know, in inferior yes, Ruby. Yes, yes, I've used that a lot. Right, where you can open up a, a second buffer, um, you know, which is running an IRB console, and you can you can send code from from your Ruby buffer into that console. But I I just really like the fact that with XMP filter, I can just insert the the output directly in line. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that that I've seen that really comes close to that, um, and and actually goes way beyond it in some ways, is is the, the this new um, Ziki. You might have seen that um, by. Uh, it's X I K I. X I K I. Okay. And so, uh, after after this this after this uh, meetup after this recording, you're gonna go look up Ziki, and you are immediately going to schedule um, a, a, a pairing session with with the author Craig Muth. <laughs> Wonderful. It's gonna be like this is off the hook. <laughs> uh, there is no way I can explain it to you. Um, because it's kind of like at this, like trying to explain org mode at this point. It's like that big and that like. I'm very so excited. That of like things you can do with it. Just check it out. You'll be blo you'll you'll love it. And actually, Craig is really big on doing pairing sessions. So, um, I think I actually have one with him coming up. There's um, just so much that you know going on <laughs> in Emacs in the community. How do you find out about these interesting things? Uh, I got it. Kind of got lucky with with Ziki. I mean, I so well. I think I would have found out about it anyway because it, it it kind of he put a video up 
he's been working on it for years, but he put a video up that that kind of went viral and 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 hit Hacker News and all those mm-hmm. those places. But actually, the weekend that he put that video up, he was um, he was at Gogoruko the same time I was the the uh, Golden right. Gate Ruby Con same time I was, and he basically just say, came up to me and said, "Hey, I want to show you this thing." <laughs> and, uh, and so I, at, I was like, "Holy crap! That is the coolest thing I have ever seen." Um. So yeah. That's probably what I'm going to make you do today. You know, you'll be like, okay, what are all the things that you would say, hey, let me show you this thing to somebody else who actually grogs Emacs too. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like, there's no, I mean, you know, I get, there, there are these places I get my Ruby news. Like, there's Ruby Weekly News that Peter Cooper does. And there isn't really, like, an Emacs Weekly News. But, but you know, there's, like, the, there's the Emacs Reddit, um, yeah, which yeah. is stuff up on there. And there are a few Emacs Twitter accounts that I follow um, that, that have some interesting news. And, Planet and, Emacsen often has really interesting blog posts too. So yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, there's, there is just so much. It's hard to keep track of uh, all the cool things that are going on out there. Siki, I should definitely check out. Yeah. Okay, so you know, so that's how you got into it, and you're clearly definitely into it. Um, I saw from your uh, like Emacs reboot series, you periodically clean house, I guess, in your configuration. How's that, that was coming one, along? <laughs> that was actually the one time I, that I've done that. I mean, because the, the configuration that I had up until I started that series uh, literally had been been with me from, from the start. Uh, so <laughs> that, in one form or another, it had followed me uh, from my Windows Emacs days. And this was, so like, on Windows, I went through InfoDoc and then XEmacs and then GNU Emacs, and then I was using um, one or the other on Linux for a while. Then I was using it. Um, I was using Aquamax on a Mac when I got a Mac. Wow! And then I ported that configuration back over to Linux when I switched back <laughs> to using X full time. Uh, and that one, you know, my my Emacs configuration followed me that whole time. Wow! Just Fun, you know, rolling up like a big snowball over time, and you know, accumulating and conglomerating, and and it was it was a mess, but but it was kind of cool that I could do that. You know, I mean, I had a lot of stuff in there that was you know you know operating system switches, so it would like check to yeah, see which yeah. operating on and try to enable something or not based on that. And uh, I had host, I had a system of host name switches where basically like you know I could have like a dot. I think it was more complicated than that, but but than this, but it was basically the basic idea was like I had a dot emacs dot host name mm-hmm. for a given host name, and it would it would load that for for whichever host it was on. Yeah. Um, and so if I had you know like work specific configuration and stuff like that, and and yeah, it followed me around for a long long time, but eventually I got kind of tired of it. It was getting kind of flaky, and and um, I felt like I wasn't using a lot of it, and I also felt like there was a bunch of stuff out there that I wanted to be using or should be using and it wasn't because um because i had this big um hard to modify configuration and so i yeah i just throw it all away and, and started building it <laughs> from scratch and it's 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 a nice exercise because it you know as i hit pain points i yeah. go out and i up to see how people are solving that particular pain point and then i d- discover neat new new tools that i didn't know about before because i was using some old and busted you know one that's not maintained anymore and, and and there's actually something way cool now tell me about a recent pain point like that um you know tell you what here's what i'm going to do because i will there's so little chance that i'll actually just remember this i'm going to open up my um my dot emacs totally. folder and I'm going to just diff it to see what stuff I've forgotten to check in lately. Oh, uh, yeah, or you can gonna... walk me through your Emacs. <laughs> uh, I like uh, looking at people's configuration, but it might have secret stuff. <laughs> Let's see. What, um, what have I added lately? Um, of course, half this stuff is commented out. That's the thing. you know. I thought, I'm going to do it really clean this time. And, of course, that didn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think what what have I added lately? Oh yeah, um so this is one of those things that I think I just looked up on Emacs Wiki or something to figure out how to do it. Um I got frustrated by the fact that I kept having to do meta x create mm-hmm. directory like I'd create a file in a, in a directory that d- didn't exist yet. Yeah. And I got tired of doing meta x create directory and so 
I found some really simple code um, that would just it hooks into the um, uh, let's see the save hook right oh. yeah before save hook okay. it hooks into before save hook which actually I, I really like that because what it doesn't bother you until you actually try to save the file so you oh. can oh you or you can say this buffer exists in this imaginary directory and has this name and, and you can start typing away and then when you when you control x control s to save it that's when it pops up and says hey this doesn't exist yet do you want to create it and I have to say yes or no and uh, it's a super um, super small piece of um, piece of elisp um, very very elegant I thought um, yeah. but I I think I stole it off someone I don't think I wrote it I didn't write it myself <laughs> It's always amazing to see how all these little frustrations can be smoothed over with a bit of Elisp. Yeah. Yeah. What, so is, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what are some example. of the other little frustrations that are on your, you know, I, 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 I'd like to fix this or find somebody in Emacs Wiki who has list. What's your, you know, what are some of the things that you'd tweak in Emacs? Um, you mean like things that I've already fixed or things that I wish were fixed? Well, things that you're about to fix or wish it were fixed or would be curious about. That is a good question. I might have to think about that for a minute. Um, I am still not totally happy with my terminal configuration in, in Emacs. Um, I've been using multi-term, yeah. which is built on top of term, term.el, which I guess is built into Emacs. And it's not half bad. Um, I really like having, uh, I really like having a console, like an, a terminal that I can pop up anywhere, uh, <laughs> pop up anywhere at any time. You know, just I bind it to F1, and it and multi-term handles it pretty well. It pops up, and I can do some terminal stuff, and then huh. hit F1, it goes away. Um, it's not perfect. I used to have something called shell toggle, which I think is 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 so unmaintained, it's not even easy to find anymore. <laughs> um, and it. It used shell uh, shell mode, not not term mode. Yeah, and yeah. It, shell mode, I mean, shell mode is more Emacsy, but it's less con it's less consolely. You know, it's it it doesn't support like you can't run you can't run Vim in, inside of yeah yeah of uh, of shell mode, whereas you can um, inside of term. You can yes. run inside of term, and um, uh, it had some niceties like the 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 key binding for toggling it the first time you it was clever the first time you hit it it would it would basically take over half of your screen so it would, it would make a new frame a new mm -hmm. uh, window emacs window which would be like half your window yeah. the second time you hit it, if you hit it twice in, in quick succession like without doing anything else in between it would maximize that right that view um so it would become your whole screen and then the third time you hit it without doing anything else in between it would make it vanish again. Yeah. Um, or even after, even after you had popped it up. But basically, um, it took care of like the three possib the the three possibilities in one keystroke. You know, either I want a terminal, but I don't want it to fill my screen. I want a terminal, but I do want it to fill my screen. Or I, you know, want this terminal to go away now. Yeah. Uh, and so it was really easy to have the muscle memory for that. And, and I keep wanting to find the time to, to fix multi-term so it'll actually do that. That sounds like, uh, a, like a last command and, you know, and then just an if, and you should be able to get that same behavior going. But, yeah, that's, that's very clever. Yeah. And I, I feel like there are a few other nitpicks that I want to fix about multi-term. I've been having some trouble with, like, the colors, mm. uh, fancy colors and stuff like that. Um, like ideally, so here's the thing. I, I I've always liked having a pop-up console for my whole desktop, mm -hmm. and I've used various packages for that. Like there have been some times when I've used tiling window managers, yeah, and yeah. I've actually just like used a regular terminal program, but I I used a special binding in the window manager so they would pop to the front over everything else, and then pop up back. You know, when I hit the button again. Yeah. Uh, and I've also used things like there's a various packages on Linux. There's like tilde. And there's Quake, and there's Yaquake. They're like three different programs that all do the same thing. You hit a hit a button, then they like bring yeah. a terminal a terminal down, and then you hit it again, and they scroll back up. I really like that. Really like having that. I've always wanted it to be an a, an Emacs terminal instead of <laughs> separate system terminal. You know, because then like I'd have all my you know the the whole Yank buff you know the whole yes. uh, kill would 
be the kill ring. Sorry, kill ring would be the same. Um, and my, you know, copy paste commands and nav key navigation, everything would be like totally familiar. Um, <laughs> and I've never quite gotten there. And it, it it needs to be like to be like system level. It would have to be like a, a dedicated frame, I think, that I could get to pop up, and then go away. Um, and I just haven't gotten to that point, and that kind of bugs me. But I totally hear you about the once you get these keyboard shortcuts wired into your brain and all the commands that you can rely on, you tend to want them in everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I've heard there that you can tell like GNOME to use. E more Emacs key bindings. I haven't actually investigated that yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some people have, you know, end up building all these little applications for Emacs for playing music or browsing the web or doing all this other stuff. And it's all yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> well, I, that, I, yeah. I did used to do some browsing in W3M mode. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of nuts, but Well, workable. actually, that plus keyboard macros worked out to be really good. <laughs> so... Mm. <laughs> Yeah, there's all sorts of power you can you can do once you start digging into um, Emacs. So you you mentioned Org is one of the applications you really like. Are the and and GNU's is one of the things that you're also looking into, pre, well periodically looking into into using. Are there any large chunks of uh, uh, other functionality that you've explored? Um, that's a good question. I've always wanted to learn the calculator mode, but I never really got around to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I use it periodically for very simple stuff. It's but got I, a I've, funny manual. <laughs> it's worth reading. <laughs> Cult? Yeah. 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 Um, I'm trying to think if there are under, uh, any other major packages. Mostly it's just modes, little modes and extensions and things. Um, what else have I used? Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by slime. If I if I spent more time in Lisp, I would, I would spend more time in slime I, I love you know the integration there but i just don't i don't have an opportunity to code lisp as, as much as i'd like mm. except for emacs lisp yeah that's that's cool too hmm so do you bump into a lot of other emacs users aside from the ones who well i guess people reach out to you because of your podcast what's it like um periodically it's interesting in the ruby world the ruby world has kind of this this, I'll go ahead and say it, kind of a faddish nature when it comes to editors. <laughs> um, so periodically I'll, I'll bump into like an old school Rubyist, and a lot of them still use Emacs. Uh, so like Jim Wyrick has been using Emacs forever. Uh, and we just had Joe O'Brien on the show. He uses Emacs. Uh, that's on the, the Ruby Rogue show, sorry. Yeah. And... Various other people like that that have been been around for a long time tend to use Emacs, and 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 actually Matt's himself, who wrote the Ruby language, yes, uh, uses you know long time Emacs user, and actually did a presentation about how Emacs uh, influenced the design of Ruby. Huh, I should track that uh, down. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting, and I think I I, I just kind of imagine all the Vim users. Cause there are a lot of Vim users in, in the the Ruby world right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just imagining. Of gnashing their teeth as they were watching that. <laughs> it's especially like, well, he talks about number one how Emacs Lisp actually designed, you know, influenced the design of the Ruby language, and also how like the the putting together the Ruby mode in Emacs um, influenced the syntax of Ruby. <laughs> like, basically, if you get if you could get the the Ruby mode in Emacs support a syntax, then he put that syntax to Ruby. But if you couldn't. No. Seriously. Seriously, it's in, it's in the presentation. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, since then, so, but, so I spend, obviously, as you know, from the stuff I'm talking about, it's, it's obvious I spend a lot of my time in the Ruby world. Yeah. And um, m most people, like, so there was a, a period of time where everybody was using TextMate because everybody migrated over to the, to the Mac and everybody used, used TextMate. For a long time, um, then TextMate kind of stagnated, and um, and all the people whose appetites had for a real editor had been had been sort of peaked by TextMate um, started discovering Vim, uh, and so now there's been 
basically everyone that I almost everyone that I do remote pairing with, and I do I, I've been doing a ton of remote pairing over the last uh, yes. half a year. Yes, I saw. Uh, that's basically been my job um, until until I got Ruby Tapas rolling. Yeah. Uh, pretty much everyone was either using Vim or uh, Sublime Text. That's kind of a new thing that's that's been making a lot of waves. Mm -hmm. But I'm starting to see a bit of a sea change. I've been starting to see some folks say, you know, what's regularly say, what's all this Emacs stuff about? <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, like my, my friend Evan Light recently made the switch over to Emacs, and he did it because he'd been doing a lot of remote pair programming uh, using Tmux. Oh, yes, yes. And um, he had gotten frustrated with sort of like the dual, like the m multi levels of, mo of modalness. Yes. Because it was sort of the modalness of Tmux, where you're either like and tel telling Tmux to do things or telling the programs inside Tmux to do things. And then there was the modalness of, of Vim inside of that. Mm -hmm. um, and he was also frustrated with like, like having to you know manage the separate terminals and stuff uh, in in, in Tmux, and he I think he s switched over over mainly because with Emacs he can have his shell inside the editor, and so for the most part he can ignore Tmux and and all of the yeah all of the moving around between shells and code is all inside the editor i'm here uh, i'm i'm getting the sense that there's a trend you know there's this like common interest in running shells inside editors which is uh, <laughs> yes a very strange and emacsy thing to do <laughs> <laughs> we do everything inside yeah, i'm trying to think what was what was one of the weirder things that i've i've done inside emacs i was i was commenting to somebody on twitter the other day that that um I think I, just, I think I laughed out loud the first time I accidentally hit enter on a PDF. Oh yes, yes, uh, yes, and it opened and, images and, and too. And actually rendered it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was like, really, <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> I know, just when you think you know what an editor is supposed to do, it goes and surprises you. I was looking. Oh. At... Oh yeah. I, I remember. I forgot. You were asking about major, like major modes that I use, or major tools written in, in Emacs oh, that I use. Things, yeah. Um, Magit. Oh yeah, Magit. yeah, 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 totally. Easily the best UI to Git you will find anywhere. Huh. I mean, I've used a bunch of them, and it's Magit puts all the others to shame. I mean, the the ease of you know of like seeing. The, the way you can sort of drill in and out of, of the, the changes that, that you've made. Yeah. Uh, I was seeing as much or as little detail as you want. And you can, I mean, you can easily, it's just like so like e intuitive and, and simple to, to either um, select a file to go into the current commit or to s just select a single chunk of that file. Um, and it's just a matter of hitting tab to expand the file out and then selecting the chunk of the file that you want in the current commit instead of selecting the whole file. It's, it's just – it's insanely um, well-crafted. Um, I've been deploying my, web, my, uh, my new, the new Ruby Tapas website directly from, <laughs> from Emacs because her, it, it, when you deploy to Heroku, it's just a Git push. Oh. And so I've been, been deploying <laughs> – side of, of Emacs and it's great. <laughs> That's fantastic. I remember when I was first starting with um with with what well, was with C, you know CVS and and then later Git using VC and and my Git is really something else. Yeah. So that is good. Yeah. So you Yeah, well and VC yeah? still it is terrific with Git as well. I mean, um but you know the, a lot of times Yeah. I just want to, you know, I'd make a change to one file. And you and just want to quickly it's... check that in. Yeah, that's that's super yeah. easy with that. But yeah, so you so you you probably get a lot of people excited about it. As you you mentioned, you see some kind of sea changes. More and more people are getting interested. Uh, do you think we've got the I guess you know the documentation, the getting started, the things that people need in order to get off and going, or or what what sort of things would make a difference for all these people? Um, I think yes and no. I think we've got some of it. Um, we could use more. Um, and I'd actually like to be more of a part of that. I was making screencasts for a while. I think um, you, you may see something more from my direction uh, coming at some point um, in, in, in that uh, 
that regard. And it's funny because I don't think of myself as an Emacs expert at all, but I think I could probably at least help people get started with it. That's the best. Uh, that's, that's the best time to make stuff because you remember, or you you'll keep bumping into the things that people will bump into. So it makes sense. Yeah. Plus, with Emacs, you know, developing as rapidly as it does, I don't really know if anyone can be an expert. It was terrible. Yeah. I was trying to write about um, like interesting things that you can do with Emacs, and then as soon as I'd post a blog post, the authors would like merge it into the, <laughs> the code. So, so in the end, I was like, okay, I've written three chapters, which are now obsolete. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, change of plans. <laughs> but there's some stuff out there. I mean, there's there's a peep code about it now, yeah. and and. Um, Emacs rocks. There, lots of blogs. There, yeah, Emacs rocks is cool. Um, there, there aren't any really good up-to-date books besides for the manual itself, as far as I know, um, which is kind of a shame. We, yeah, it, it, we could do better. And I think, I mean, the one thing that that everyone notes about getting started with Emacs is that it does not come configured in sort of a modern way out of the box, or at least what people think of as a modern way. It doesn't really make a lot of concessions to, like, <laughs> how, yes. how you might think about the world and how you might be used to using editors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, out of the box, it, it, you know, because it's very much this this sort of, I mean, it's it's a lot of it is incredibly modern, but as far as the way it's configured out of the box, yeah. you know, it's kind of there's a lot of throwbacks to. Uh, to the old days, and uh, to, because that's the default, and no one's going to change the default. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. There would be much wailing and gnashing of teeth, um, and pulling of, of beards. Um, I was very if... excited about the, uh, the 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 increasing popularity of starter kits. So I was just coming. I was just reading about the starter kit for the social sciences, which gets you mm. set up with everything you need to write papers and uh, do R and you know visualize your data and all of that stuff it's like it's great to see people package things and you were telling me that anecdote of people who were using emacs without knowing it was emacs <laughs> yeah so um uh yeah i'll, I'll, I'll tell that again um <laughs> and this is actually this is like second hand at this point so this is actually a a story that joe o'brien just just told when he was on the ruby rogues podcast uh but he said that that he was on like a a international flight and there was this European scientist sitting next to him. I think he was like, um, might have been part of the LH LHC process, pro ah, project, or something like that. And um, and Joe's watching him, and and he pulls out his laptop and he boots it up, and it's this custom version of Linux. And so he gets kind of kind of interested. And then the scientist opens up Emacs uh, and starts, you know, typing away in Emacs. And Joe's like. Uh, Hey, I see you use Emacs. And the scientist is like, "What?" <laughs> and gives him a blank stare. And it turns out this guy doesn't know Emacs from Linux. He doesn't even know where one stops and the other begins. But he's it's just that to do this the keystrokes. Was, this was the software that they showed him how to use, and he's happily doing science on Emacs um, because that that was you know the project software that that he was set up with. So it's it's interesting what all you know the the. The folks are um, are using it. It's you know, like, you think of it as such yeah. a like hardcore nerd tool. Um, and, well, and so I a guess lot of people are nerds too. But... And you know, so, so writers have taken to org in a big way. Um, mm. People do uh, people do like DNA editing in Emacs. There's a mode for it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's and a like, lot. Like you were saying, people compose music in Emacs. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, I, I remember I was I was checking out Lily Pond for um, transcribing music for something, and and of course there's a mode for it because there's a mode for everything. <laughs> of course. Yeah. 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 So it'd be it'd be interesting to see how Emacs spreads. You know, you get this this idea, I guess, that Emacs is either for old fogies or computer geeks, or it's, it's you know the kind of right. thing people only run into in computer science degrees. But I guess. Emacs tends to spread kind of by people bumping into other people or people looking at screencasts and going, how did you get your commands to output things to the same page? So, yeah. uh, so your, your screencasts are doing a wonderful service in that, in that direction. Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, yeah, the, the stuff that I'm able to do, like sometimes I just have to make a screencast to be like, like, you know, you folks are missing out. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to check this 
was like, I I forget. Um, oh yeah, I did one. It I discovered, um, sort of you know from you know anecdotally and looking over people's shoulders and stuff, that a lot of developers just like weren't used to working in an editor. Either they weren't using the tools available to them, or they didn't have the tools to dig deeply into a file's history um, in a meaningful way while they were coding. And, you know, and this is sort of one of those, those long-time debates. You know, do you, like, do you leave comments in your code to explain the history of why, you know, why things are the way they are? Um, I've even seen people that were like, we comment out the old code yeah, rather than deleting of, yeah. it because, so that you can see the, the, the evolution of it or in case we need that again, you know, even though it's under source control. And, um, and a lot of this stuff just sort of seemed nuts to me, like why, you know, that's what the, you know, the history of the file, like why things are the way they are, that's what the, the, the version history is for. And then I realized after looking over a lot of shoulders, a lot of people don't have the version history of a file at their fingertips. They just don't like like if they want to see the version history, they go to GitHub or yeah. something and they actually look up the file there. You know, and you know, and if if, if it's the only his, if it's like local history or something, they're yeah. screwed. Um and so just, I did like, a screencast and, yeah. right, of you know, how it's like one keystroke to annotate and have um you know, have the 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 file broken up colorized by who did what when. And with the little comment of why next to it, and then like hit keys to page backwards and forwards, like I can just page through time and see the changes. And that's all within the editor, and so it's all very present. It's not like it's not a chore to go look it up. It's just right there. And it changes the way you work. You know, it's not just it's not just a convenience. It changes how you write code when you know you have the history, you know, when the history is part of the file you're looking at rather than something that you have to dig around for. Um, and, yeah, so I like to share this stuff because people are missing out. <laughs> yeah, I hear that a lot from, from people who are curious about Emacs but haven't made a jump. They, they feel like they're missing out on, on a lot of interesting functionality, and they are. <laughs> so. Yeah, <laughs> they really are. They really are. I... I, I I know that because I was there, you know, a long time ago, but I was there and, and then I got into the Emacs world and I, I you know, didn't want to go back. And, and it really is about building up an environment. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the fundamental shift that people go through or like, at least that I went through is that it's not so much that it's an editor. It's, you know, it's that it's a list machine that you can write your, port, write your, your development environment in portably and dynamically, you know, and you don't have to reboot the whole thing in order to, to try out the changes to your development environment. Um, you know, you can just start banging out some code and now you have a new tool yeah. that you didn't have a moment ago. And you can and, peek under uh, the covers and tweak things just a little bit to fit you better. And right, have because, that running. because it's all in, in Lisp and it's the same way working in Ruby code is, yeah. is, you know, it really changes things when you go from the model of, well, there's the system that we can't change, and then there are some points where we can hook into it and, and change it. Whereas Emacs, the whole system, you know, the whole system is just live Lisp code that you can edit. And, uh, and so it's not so much about writing plugins as it is about rewriting the system itself. That's what I really like about Ruby too, because the the freedom yeah. of just opening up a class, sticking or you know adding some more behavior to something is something that many many other programming platforms lack. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you end up doing all these weird contortions to make something happen. And with both Emacs, Lisp, and Ruby, it's easy to modify that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I should probably wrap up the podcast around here, you know, keep it in somewhere in people's attention spans, but I'd love to stay on and chat with you about anything else or learn more about your experiments with delegation and all these other good things. But, but oh, okay. first, sure. you know, I will thank you for sharing your wonderful Emacs stories, and I'm glad I got a chance to chat with you about the, the way that you use it. Thanks for sharing with us. Oh, my yeah. pleasure. Thank you.